Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to today's um, presentation. My name is Aisha Dixon. Um, and with us, we have Dan Mitchell from the Emeriti Association, which will, he'll be our um, speaker today to introduce our other speaker. So without any further ado, Dan, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Adam, I think you can see that this is a sort of informal event. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll treat it as such. Uh, uh, I teach a course uh, each winter uh, on California policy issues and so on. But most of the people who are speaking are guest speakers. Uh, and uh, so we conduct it in some sense uh, very much uh, the way we're going to conduct this, in which uh, we are going to ask questions and go back and forth and so on. So I'm hoping we can do that. Uh, and uh, uh, most of our audience, are, of course, are UCLA, they're Meriti, they're retirees, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, most of them will not have come from the journalism business okay. uh, or Good. the newspaper business. And so uh, I want to uh, start, and this is what I always would do in the, in the classroom when we had guest speakers, um, I would ask uh, our speaker to... Tell us a little bit about how you got to do what it is that you're now doing. Uh, a little bit of a sort of a career path. Okay, uh, I can do that. So um, when I was in college, which was Purchase College, State University of New York, as a freshman, I was asked if I wanted to come write a story for the newspaper. Um, Purchase was, I think, in, in the first year of its existence, it was really a new college. And so the newspaper was new and it was named, unfortunately, and not by me, The Load. And uh, literally after writing the first story of a road, I realized that this is what I want to do. And, and I, I realized not only that I want to be a reporter, but that I wanted to be a, a political reporter for the New York Times. And my clarity was such and expressed enough that when I went to college reunions, you know, 30 years later, people would always be like, hey, I can't believe you got to do what you wanted to do. So um, from there, I got a job, this is in Westchester County, at a local newspaper, the Reporter Dispatch in White Plains, where I spent a couple of years covering school boards and town halls and um, county government, I think a little bit. And they sent me up to Albany, which as you all know, is the state capital. And I did that for a while. And I got hired by the New York Daily News to join the Albany Bureau. Um, and I spent a couple of years, I still, by the way, very focused on wanting to end up at the New York Times. And I spoke to a, a friend of mine who worked at the Times and asked whether he thought it'd be a good idea for me to go to the Daily News, given that ambition. And he said, yes. So I spent a couple of years there. Um, and then after working the Daily News, I went to USA Today to cover the presidential campaign of Bill Clinton, that's 1992. Um, I took a lead to write a book and I came back after that to work for the New York Times. I, started uh, covering national politics in 97, then came back to New York and did metropolitan, i.e. New York politics for, I guess, five years. And then after that, I went to Washington in 2002, become the chief political reporter, which I did through 2010. Um, I remember being there the night that Barack Obama won and writing that story and thinking, I'll never get to write a story as historic as this again. And, what should I do next? And they came to me and asked me if I would have any interest in becoming the Los Angeles bureau chief. And I had thought that I wanted to do something else, go overseas or go someplace else in the country. And I came out here and spent some time and decided, yeah, no, I do want to do that. So I did that from, I think, 2010 to 2018, which is an unusually long time for that beat. Because um, normally people, they move people out because everyone wants to come into it. And then I took a leave to write another book and I just came back and I'm now the uh, West Coast cultural correspondent for the Times as of two weeks ago. So, and hey. hopefully that wasn't too long. But that's no, that's that, that, that was great. Now, uh, again, since we're we're we've got an audience that is uh, not in the journalism business, uh, would you say that kind of career path of sort of moving around is sort of typical for 
reporters, if I've sampled reporters from the New York Times, would they have followed similar kinds of paths? I think so. I mean, people follow different paths, but one of the things that somebody told me here, a veteran New York Times reporter named R.W. Apple, we had dinner in Washington many years ago, and um, I think it was on the second martini, <laughs> he said to me, you should take advantage of this place and be sure to go to other places. And don't end up being one of those people who just spend 30 years doing the same thing because there's so much opportunity here. So that's part of it. I think if you're smart, you want to do that. The other part is that there is a real culture uh, and emphasis on moving people around. Like I said before, I thought I was in Los Angeles eight years, whatever it is, that was too long. I think you want to bring new people in with new perspectives and fresh eyes and also a different sort of sense of how to cover the state. So therefore, from the perspective of the newspaper and from the perspective of individuals, uh, there is normally, and there should be, in my opinion, a fair amount of movement around the world and the newspaper by its correspondents. So I guess I am typical. So, uh, so if you're coming from a, a different location, uh, so you were coming essentially from the East Coast mm -hmm. uh, for, for most of your career, uh, what, what do you do to prepare yourself to suddenly go out to the West Coast and, and a different city and so on? I mean, part of what they want to do is they want to drop you into this unfamiliar environment to learn it and to report on it in a fresh kind of way. As it turned out, because um, I was covering national politics, I had been coming to LA and California pretty regularly um, over the years. So I had somewhat of a sense of it. I realized after I got here, nowhere near as good a sense of it as I have now um, of its opportunities and what makes it so interesting. Um, and then the other thing I do when I come out or start a new beat is I just read everything, newspapers, books, talk to as many people as possible. And certainly in the first couple of years, you know, I made a point of saying yes to every dinner party or anytime anyone wants to meet for coffee. And that's a way to really learn things and just really kind of have an open mind. Um, and just living here is a way to learn it. Like I was very aggressive of, you know, going places all the time and trying new things, obviously pre COVID and exploring new things. And so it's a combination of the life experience and the journalism experience kind of mold to help you learn the beat that you have to learn. So uh, now tell us a little bit about what is what is a bureau chief? What what do I if I go to the L, the New York Times bureau? What do I find? Uh, one of those old scenes of people sort of typing away and you know uh, running around and so on. What, what would I find there? What what's going on there? So I think if you went there right now, you'd find a lot of dust and paper. <laughs> I don't think we've been in the office for six or eight months. When I got the bureau chief job. I realized it's one of this weird thing, what weird things about the times. I, I called my mother and told her I was getting the job, but she was like, okay, that sounds great, but I'm surprised you want to give up writing. Um, and I did. The bureau chief job is really in many ways just a title. Um, you get your own office, or you did, you don't anymore, and you get kind of an assistant, but that, and you're kind of in charge of the coverage only in that you get first choice of stories, again, in theory. But generally is a glorified correspondent. And the reason they give you the title of bureau chief, truth be told, is it allows them to take you out of, out of the union so they have to worry about paying you overtime. That, that really is like, I think the main reason why. But it's kind of a cool title and it impresses people. Um, the bureau itself is a group of people. It changes time to time. But generally, I think when I was there, there were four people covering news. Um, there were two people covering Hollywood. There was someone covering business. There was someone covering immigration. Um, I might be forgetting someone, so apologies if I am. And we all kind of work on our own. I mean, we were we were very collegial and we were able to share stories. And I don't think there were every conflict ever any conflicts. And we socialized and hung out, and hung out which I think helped. But the correspondents, the reporters, all basically communicated and were run by uh, editors back in um, in New York. So it wasn't like I was sitting there with a pipe or a cigar. I don't smoke either, but you know, saying, you, hey, there's a fire down on Hope Street, go down there. It's not like that at all. But we there has to be some coordination because A, when big breaking stories happen, you know, say that shooting out in San Bernardino, we're all on it and we all kind of work together, but we're coordinated mainly by New York. And you know, if I'm like, well, I want to do a story on Governor Newsom, I, I you know, as a courtesy, would we'll make sure no one else is looking to do the same thing. But there's enough news. Um, 
And we also have a huge bureau up in San Francisco, as you may or may not know. I don't even know the number of reporters. A lot of reporters, but many of them are covering Silicon Valley. Uh, here, we're all mostly covering news and separate contingent covering entertainment slash Hollywood. Okay, so now tell us a little bit about your, your new title. Uh, what, what, what does it mean to be the West Coast cultural person? <laughs> I'm gonna do the best job I can to answer the question with the caveat that I'll probably be able to answer it better after I've been doing it for a year. It's a new position and I'm covering culture in the West Coast and that has to do with how it inter intersect, interacts with power, philanthropy, politics, civic culture. And um, I think I have a pretty broad palette in terms of how I want to approach it with our running about you know, visual arts or performing arts or small theaters or big theaters or, um, you know, the Hollywood Bowl or whatever. So there's a lot of different stuff and I'm figuring out as I go along. But the feeling was that this is a part of the country with an enormously important culture kind of center. And, and not only is it important to the way California views itself and operates, it's also very influential in the world. Um, I don't think we've ever, in fact, I'm sure that we've never had a correspondent with this particular beat before. So it shows the interest of the paper in covering this kind of thing. So I'm learning as I go along. I mean, they're just sort of like, go out there and do it. Every now and then the paper invents a new beat and you go out and do it. And that's what's happening now, which is fine with me. It's very, it seems very exciting and challenging, but I'm not being evasive. I hope I don't sound that way. I just, I'm kind of figuring out as I go along, which is probably a good way to do this. Well, one thing I noticed, uh, uh, as you know, the, the New York Times puts out this thing called California Today. Uh, and uh, for those uh, listening who don't know, you can get it. It's a sort of a daily email uh, kind of newsletter of California-oriented uh, events. Uh, and uh, you were interviewed in that yeah. uh, newsletter <laughs> uh, about the very much what we're talking about. And I noticed, um, and this will explain this peculiar background that I've got here. Yeah. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, rail station that was closest to UCLA back in the days before Los Angeles uh, uh, totally you know, uh, uh, terminated its uh, rail system which it's now now building back. So exactly. this is how people, if you wanted to go to UCLA, you you got to the station at Santa Monica Boulevard in Westwood. I should ask where it is. So that's Santa where, that's where that would be. Yeah. Uh, this is a 1941 picture, which I colorized to make it a little bit more uh, exciting. But in any event, I noticed in that uh, interview that you did uh, that one of the things you mentioned was public transit. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just uh, art museums and that sort of thing. Uh, so why did you, uh, you know, pick uh, public transit as one of the topics uh, that would sort of fit into this cultural umbrella? Um, so when interviewing for this first story, in other words, talking to people about this first story, one thing I heard again, again and again from leaders of various cultural institutions is that they're biggest obstacle here in getting people through the door is that it's so difficult to get places. The, the public transportation system here is so underdeveloped right now, and there is more and more traffic. Um, and I don't know where people on this call live, but I, I mean, if you're at UCLA and you want to go to something at Disney Hall or LA Opera, that's something to think about. And I think it may, because it takes so long to get there. And I think that means, that is why so many people think that the success in um, expanding and elevating, so to speak, the transit system is pretty central to the success of the kind of cultural network they're hoping to build here. And that was why I looked at it. I mean, it, you know, as you know, there is this 121 billion, I think is the figure, um, transit expansion program that's going on off the money that was raised by uh, uh, an initiative that was approved, I think, two or three years ago. So, like for example, I, I believe um, I'm almost sure about this that even though they're not replacing that red street line, the new rail line they're um, building that goes under Wilshire will go pretty sh close to where you are. They'll go to, I think it'll go on Wilshire instead of Santa Monica. Um, it reminds you what a tragedy it was that they tore up that trolley line. That was an incredible loss. So they're now they're trying to rebuild it. So I think everyone thinks it's pretty critical to the future of LA in general, and in particular, the future of its cultural institutions. Yeah. By the way, as you probably know, one of the stops 
on the new rail line that's being built under Wilshire, I think it's the purple line, I don't hold me to that, um, is right across from LACMA. And the director of LACMA, Michael Govan, said that his plan is to open up the new gallery there, the David Geffen galleries, um, simultaneously with the new uh, Metro stop. And we'll see whether they can pull that off, but it's a good aspiration. Oops. Somebody, somebody needs to meet. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, well, you mentioned LACMA, so that does get us into the museums. And, uh, uh, they are, in fact, building a subway stop uh, right uh, where the, the new component of the museum is being built. What's your take on that? Uh, we had a pretty elaborate LACMA, uh, and uh, we've torn it down and <laughs> now yeah. building, uh, building a new one. What, what, what's your perception about all of that? I mean, I think we have here a very aggressive, I would argue visionary, but you know, we, we'll see, <laughs> museum director <coughs> in Michael Govett. And um, I think his feeling was that A, well, he'll tell you that the buildings that were torn down, four of them, I think, were all needed extensive renovation, earthquake, uh, uh, seismic, plumbing, everything. And the buildings are basically falling down. And you know, I think there's some controversy about this, but I think a lot of people or some people think that those buildings weren't particularly nice or functional. I mean, I'll just, I'll defer to that to other people. Um, I will say they always struck me as a little bit claustrophobic and confusing, but I won't pretend to be an architecture critic. So they're tearing it down to replace this new um, building, modern building that will go across um, Wilshire Boulevard um, and it's elevated. You can look online and look at the look at the schematics of it, and it's definitely dramatic and um, new. And you know, I think we'll we'll find out. You know, some people are complaining it's too small and they just have enough room, and it's not displaying the permanent collection the way the old galleries did. You know, on the other hand, by the time that's done, which is I think 2024, by the time the new Academy Museum is done, which is right up the street, um, they're redoing the Tarbit <coughs> the Tarbit Museum. That's going to be an interesting section of stretch of LA. And I think that, you know, we'll see whether government is right in terms of wanting, thinking the time it has come to rebuild and reimagine LACMA. Um, those buildings were all about 50 years old, except for one. They're all, one was built in the 80s. They're all pretty old. So, but obviously there's been a lot of, you know, it's not a, it's not a clear matter. There's all, there are people who have been critical of him and of what he's doing for this. Have you, have you uh, talked directly to Govan? Is that uh, part of your yeah, beat? I talked to him for the story. Uh, he's quoted the story that appeared, I think, today, or I'm losing track. Um, and a couple of years ago, when I was on the news side, on the national desk, I did a profile of him as he was trying to raise money. Um, and I think I'm going to return to that so I can do another story on him over the next couple of months in this new job. And exploring some of these questions we're looking at now, um, What's he doing? How successful is it? What kind of chance is it? But he has very big ideas of what he thinks LA, where LA is going and what it looks like. We, we had uh, quite a bit of attention paid to the uh, death of Eli Broad, who of course is, uh, was quite interested in cultural affairs and sponsored uh, museums and he's got a museum named after himself. And uh, we have, a, I'm out here in Santa Monica, there's a uh, a kind of theater uh, complex uh, and and so on. Uh, he had some uh, back and forth with uh, with LACMA and then uh, sort of pulled out of it. Uh, uh, and you know, all of that sort of struck me at the time that you know we have these sort of titans of, of wealth that are sort of uh, determining these things. And I wonder what you what you make out of that. Uh, uh, is that uh, is that something that's unique to LA or is this uh, something you'd find in other cities? I I actually can't think of another Eli Broad like figure in New York or any other city who is so kind of singular and so kind of influential. Um, part of it is that other cities have more people who are giving money to these cultural institutions and for a while it was Eli Broad and a little, almost alone, not entirely obviously. And there are good things and bad things. On one hand, he was very generous. And as you said, he's responsible for the Brody. You know, he, um, he rescued Disney Hall when it looked like it was going down the tubes. Same with Mocha. Um, I mean, he gave, gave lots of money. 
you know, on the other hand, he had very strong ideas of how, as we saw when he broke away from Blackma and Michael Govan, uh, whatever that was 10 years ago, on what he wants done with the money. Um, so I don't know whether in the culture we're in now, um, whether someone like him could exist or would in fact be tolerated. Um, so my totally back of the envelope guess is to the extent there's a new Mike, to the extent there's a new Eli Broad, it will be a group of contributors, philanthropists, who will contribute to the city's kind of arts uh, world. But I'm not sure we'll see another Eli Broad, someone as singular, someone as powerful, someone as much of um, a bulldozer, <laughs> as I think we, I referred to him today, as him. And there's good and bad to that. Yeah, much was made, uh, if you go back into history, the, the history of the building of the Music Center mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the role of Dorothy Chandler from the Chandler family that uh, owned the LA Times for, for many, many years. And so uh, I want to sort of go back to this world of journalism. I mean, it's yeah. probably no accident that, uh, that, that all of that uh, happened with somebody who came out of the, the newspaper, the primary newspaper family of that uh, era. Uh, and uh, sort of pushed forward with that uh, with that uh, whole complex there. Uh, uh, I wonder now what your take is on the role of newspapers and journalism in the, the whole world of culture. Uh, I mean, it, we 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 can see that the, there are some people who, by dint of having a lot of wealth, can endow a museum and, and have their uh, uh, their influence on the cultural scene. Uh, what, what is uh, sort of the influence of newspapers and, uh, uh, and such on, on uh, trends in, in culture these days? I think it's, it still exists, but it's much less than it was for all the obvious reasons. There's many other people, there's many other voices, um, there's more people talking. Newspapers in general are not as powerful as they used to be for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, but you know, say the New York Times or the LA Times, you know, what it writes about a movie or a play or an art exhibition is definitely going to um, influence how well it does. To that extent, it's important. But you know, you can look, you can get a million different other opinions online, right? So the way, say a Broadway reviewer in the New York Times could close a show in one night, I'm not sure that's the case anymore because there's so many other people weighing in. Um, so that to me is really one of the main way, ways that newspapers sort of influence culture um, in places like New York and to a lesser extent, Los Angeles. The, you know, the Chandler's here, they were much more involved in building the civic culture of the city. Um, and again, I think that era has passed. I mean, you don't have publishers like that anymore for the most part. I'd like to turn to your sort of previous uh, stint as uh, uh, the LA uh, bureau chief again, uh, and talk about some California issues and how you, in part, uh, how you think these are going to play out, not just in the, the immediate California scene or the Los Angeles scene, uh, but also uh, sort of nationally. So we have this recall going on uh, of uh, the governor. It looks uh, almost 100% likely that that's going to occur. Uh, I know there is a lawsuit and this and that, but uh, it seems like it's going to going to happen. And I wonder what your take is on how this. What does this look like to the rest of the country? Um, you know, I think part of it is it sort of feeds the idea of California being a little bit um, wild westy in its politics. Um, you know, especially because you know uh, you have the sort of the. Diver I'm not sure I want to use the word diversity, the range of candidates running. And um, um, part of it is that I think the media or the non-California media is going to focus on the more out there candidates, um, which sort of reinforces the idea of California as being, I think incorrectly and unfairly, as California being kind of like wacky and crazy, which I don't think is, is true at all. Um, but I think that's a lot of what's going on. From a political point of view, you know, it shows the sort of intensity of the, you know, the sort of conservative wing of the Republican Party here in going after Newsom. Um, I, you know, right now, I think you're right. It's definitely going to qualify and get on the ballot. And there's a suit out there. Right now, it seems very unlikely that a recall will be approved by voters. 
but it's a ways off. And you know, anyone who lives in California knows that who who knows what could happen over the next six months between wildfires and you know smoke from wildfires and God forbid an earthquake and you know who know you know um, Newsom making another misstep like the dinner he had at the French Laundry. So, but right now it looks like unlikely that he's going to lose this thing. But I, you know, I've been around long enough to know that anything can happen. And I think one of the big questions um, for Democrats is they've made at Newsom's behest the strategic decision to keep a Democrat off the ballot. Just backing up for a second, the way it works is these these are two part votes. In the first part, you vote A or A, up or down on recall. And the second part is you vote for who you'd want to be the next governor. And Newsom cannot be on that. And right now, the only candidates who are on that list are Republicans or not, let's just say not Democrats. And Newsom trying to keep a Democrat off. I think the question Democrats need to ask themselves is, do they want a Democrat there just in case Newsom gets recalled? Otherwise, you might end up with Catelyn Jenner as, you know, as governor. I'm not sure that, um, that Democrats here would be happy with that. But right now, Newsom doesn't want that, and the Democratic Party organization doesn't want that. So we'll see. We'll see where we are as we get closer to the vote itself. Yeah, you know, one one thing that uh, struck me about uh, that episode is that uh, California maybe traditionally uh, the different candidates in any election they sort of run on their own, and in fact, we call most of the elections technically nonpartisan. So. Uh, we don't have the traditional primaries the way uh, many other states do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have primaries in which everybody runs and you take the top two and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, Newsom, on the other hand, seems to have a great deal of authority, you know, without, <laughs> without you know, sort of lines of authority uh, in, uh, unlike, say, Gray Davis, who... Uh, uh, had uh, Democrats did get on the um, did get on the ballot in his uh, in his situation. Uh, so, what do you make of Newsom? He seems to have a, sort of a, uh, a, a, a an authority over uh, potential Democrats that may be a little bit surprising in this situation. I think Newsom is more dynamic and assertive than Gray Davis was. Um, he Davis, as you recall, was you were, I assume you're around then was very unpopular in a way that Newsom is not. And um, I think he didn't, he wasn't a strong finger. And I think Newsom is um, and more aggressive. Newsom also has a lot, as we saw this week, Newsom because of the California budget has a lot of money now, has a couple of things going for him. A huge surplus, like a mind boggling surplus. And which has allowed him to fund homeless programs and refunds and you know, all that kind of stuff's gonna help. Um, COVID, knock on wood, seems to really, really, really have made a turnaround. I mean, we're, you know, we're more, more, they're, they announced, the CDC announced today that they're, as you know, they're removing the mask mandate for, in most cases, for people who are vaccinated. California's numbers are, I think, the lowest in the country now, which is pretty astounding if you think of where we were, particularly here in Los Angeles a couple of months ago. So he's got a lot to run on, and Davis had nothing like that. Nothing like that. The other big difference here is um, Schwarzenegger was a very credible, popular candidate. He had a lot of problems at the time. There were, as I recall, questions about womanizing and some stuff about his past. But he had a very clear campaign presence, a sense of showmanship, which I think matters in any state, in any campaign, and a clear um, philosophy of what he thought government should be doing. So he was always a, a strong candidate in the way that so far none of the other candidates this time appear to be um, for, for Newsom. So that I think is a big different, it's a different dynamic that he's facing than Gray Davis faced back in every year that was yeah, the other The other big headline for uh, California was the release uh, of a recent uh, uh, a set of data that suggested that uh, California's population had not only stopped growing, uh, but uh, had actually uh, declined over the past year. Uh, it actually had been growing very slowly even before that. So the difference between, you know, a little bit below zero and a little bit above zero may may not be uh, all that note noteworthy statistically. But obviously, uh, the the people take less than zero is a uh, 
as a significant uh, element. Uh, and I wonder how that's being seen around the country. Um, I think that it contributes to the idea that California is no longer the powerful, dominant state that it once was. I think that people have always liked to root against California the way they like to root against New York. Um, and I think stuff like that, fairly or not, feeds that. So, and same thing, unfortunately, you know, when California was dealing with the wildfires last year or any one of a million catastrophes that happened here. I think that people, some people in other parts of the country take some schadenfreude in that. And I think this is the same kind of thing. They like to see California brought down because California has always been like, everything that happens in the country happens here first. And this is where the coolest new politicians are, the coolest new policies. And this is where you go for the future of America and, you know, uh, enterprise and sunshine and all that stuff. And it's not just Hollywood, it's Silicon Valley and everything. So, you know, I think these past couple of years have taken down the perception of California a few notches. People, I mean, there's a lot of debate about how many people are really leaving, but some people are leaving given the taxes and living condition here. The numbers you referred to, I think key question will be next year or the year after, because to what extent was that a result of COVID deaths? Uh, which are almost certainly being underreported, um, not deliberately, but just, just the way it is. And the strictures, the cuts, the reductions in immigration that happened under President Trump, which is going is to start changing now under Biden, will we begin seeing populations start going up again? But either way, you know, the problems the state faces, you know, it's going to have to deal with, you know, starting obviously with homelessness and poverty. Yes, uh, so that uh, sort of connects us to uh, uh, some Californians who, who did leave, although they left for special reasons, the Kamala Harris being one. Uh, so we have some uh, uh, people who were, uh, uh, and I guess uh, Javier Becerra would be another very prominent Californian who went, uh, uh, went uh, east uh, to Washington. So how, how, do you, uh, how do you evaluate our Californians now in the in the Biden administration. It's, it hasn't been all that long, but how do you see that? Yeah, it's a little early. Um, I've been watching Ms. Harris closer. Um, I think, you know, I've seen some of this coverage has been a little bit negative, but I, I think she's doing a pretty good job. It's hard being a vice president and she's only been there for a month. And I think that she's someone we've got to watch very closely because she could very well be the next president. And I think so far she's doing okay. Um, it's, she's obviously in a very new world. She, even though she's moved to Washington, I believe she's kept her place in Los Angeles. She's back here every couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, uh, in a sense, she was in the Senate and she's still in the Senate because uh, the vice president is technically the, the presiding officer there and she has to cast uh, critical votes if yeah, it's going to be 50 50. Uh, she's 51, right? Do, do you have any senses? I mean, does she. Uh, although she's uh, in that uh, sort of peculiar position of, in a way, kind of holding two offices, so that is she maintaining her Senate contacts uh, or is she sort of more shifted over to the uh, administration and, you know, sort of policy uh, making and that sort of thing? My sense is she's more in the White House and trying to become part of, making sure she's part of um, Biden's sort of inner circle and, Knowing Senator Schumer, who's the majority leader, uh, I'm not sure he would be that eager to share whatever kind of power. <laughs> he has. So, but my sense is she's trying to really make sure she has a presence in the White House. Uh, and what would you say about Bracera? I mean, he's moved into a very different kind of role there in terms of just uh, where he was in California, in terms of his responsibilities and where, what he's got now. Yeah, I know. I think it's a little, in that case, I think it's really too early to tell because he's only just really been in there for a month or so. But I'm definitely watching him closely. Now, he, one of the, uh, he's in the, uh, uh, the health and human uh, sources, uh, health and, and human services uh, area now. And you, you had mentioned the homeless issue here in California. Uh, and that sort of takes us also back to the, state, uh, how, how is the, how, are people just sort of looking at these photographs of these uh, sort of tent encampments around the country? Uh, how, how, do, how is that perceived? I mean, I think that California, mainly because the picture photographs here is viewed as the 
place with the worst homeless problem challenge in the country, um, which I think is mostly borne out by statistics. I think that's true. So, and we all know some of the reasons why that's going on, but that's more, I think most people will tell you a state and local problem than a federal problem. And you can see Newsom and to a lesser extent here, Garcetti trying to deal with it. But the change has been really striking over the past couple of years and particularly over the past couple of, particularly over the past couple of months, the prevalence and the visibility of homelessness all over Los Angeles. It's really something. And it's particularly striking because I know we just, LA just approved all this new money to build temporary and permanent uh, housing structures um, to begin dealing with it. It hasn't been dealt with yet, but it seems to me that's something that the next mayor or this mayor and the current governor are really going to have to deal with because I think that sort of feeds people's negative perception about California, including people who live here. I mean, that's what you hear about all the time here when people talk about quality of life um, is just how bad homelessness has gotten here. And again, I think that's more, you know, there's money coming out of the feds, but that's definitely more of a California challenge, Los Angeles challenge, San Francisco challenge than a Washington challenge. And I think you saw Newsom this week as he's throwing around all this money, uh, announcing, you know, I forget the figure, was it 10 billion? A large figure to try to deal with homelessness across the state. And it's urgent. I think people really need to do it. I mean, if you guys, are, you, I mean, you, where you are, um, you can certainly see it, you know, right by the VA. It's like the, the, the problem is really something. I can certainly see it over here in Hollywood where I live. The uh, uh, sort of another issue here in the state, which I'm not sure how much play it gets outside the state, has been the question of uh, school reopening and what what exactly uh, that means and whether uh, we are uh, following the right course uh, or you know exactly what's happening. Uh, do you have some? Is it is this something that uh, that uh, people around the country are, are looking at in, in terms of California's performance there? Or is this just a more of a local issue? I think this is more of a national issue and that California is an example of a place that's been going pretty slowly in dealing with it. Um, um, and that people take that as a sort of source of Democrats' uh, reluctance to take on the teachers union. I, I kind of think that might be oversimplifying what the issue is here. but. That is the whole question of people going, of kids being able to go back to school, I think is one of the critical issues. And it's a national issue. And if you recall, when Biden took office, he pledged, I'm not gonna get the exact figures right, but I think he said that within a hundred days, we'll have most kids back getting in-person learning. Um, it's all, as you know, more better than I do, there are all kinds of problems and reasons why it's so urgent. You know, whether it's the fact that there's plenty of evidence that education homeschooling or, or virtual learning just is nowhere near as effective as classrooms. And I think one of the, when you look at some of these um, people not seeking jobs or unemployment figures, it reflects the fact that a lot of parents need to stay home to take care of their, of their kids. I think that Biden um, got that. And that's one of the reasons he's made it such an urgent priority and why um, it's a big factor of, of, I guess, his second spending bill. So I would, you know, LA, California has been a behind, I think, a lot of the country on this, but I think it's much more of a national issue, and I would look at it much more nationally. And you get the sense that things are changing, right? You get the sense that there, as more and more people get vaccinated, some of these strictures get lessened, that we'll be in a much better place come the fall than we are right now, or certainly than we were, you know, in December. When, uh, when uh, President Trump uh, was in office, uh, he used to point to things like homelessness in California and uh, San Francisco and LA and so on. And uh, uh, he never, he would somehow offer to sometimes come and fix it, but <laughs> never, never, never clear exactly what that meant. But he did make an issue of it. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is a, an issue. Uh, and as you say, it, it be, even nationally, people worry about the school reopening and so on. Uh, is, is this something where the Biden administration might, for different, very different reasons than the Trump administration, uh, come to California and try to maybe hurry things up or uh, improve the situation in one way or another? I think that what Trump was doing was basically trolling California and trolling Newsom. And I was never sure how serious he was about 
coming in and doing anything about any of this stuff. And in fact, he didn't really do anything if you think about it. Um, I think at one point they even talked about saying the National Guard in here to you know, you know, round homeless people up. I, I can't see the Biden administration doing that. And watching Biden and the people around him, I think anything they're gonna do is gonna be much more cooperative. One of the sort of seismic changes, excuse me, sea changes that we've seen is that there's no longer this war between the federal government and Sacramento, the state government that there was here for so long, because Trump was in power because there are so many people here defying Trump. That is mostly kind of ended um, and there's much more cooperation. And I think you'll see it in terms of more money coming to California and you're not gonna see, or the things about the emission standards, you're not gonna see California try to, um, the federal government try to undermine what California is doing. It's a big change. I mean, I think that in terms of the big, the way the world changed after Biden was elected, or maybe the, we should say after Trump was defeated, was California standing in the country and its relationship with the federal government. It's easy to forget now, Daniel, how bad um, things were between Trump and California in general. That was an ongoing story that we wrote about a lot. But one one thing that you know we mentioned the recall and uh, uh, another sort of feature that the California regularly uh, has is uh, with proliferation of ballot uh, initiatives of one type or another, and not just at the state level. We have local ones as well as state ones, and so on. So we have this whole direct democracy of which the the recall is uh, is a component. Uh, as a as a journalist, you're trying to interpret this for an audience who uh, maybe lives uh, in areas where getting things on the ballot and recalling candidates and all of that is, is not uh, quite so, uh, quite so uh, common. Uh, how, how do you go about explaining uh, California's odd uh, governance uh, features? You know, it was a running theme of our coverage because it's so interesting and important. The first thing we needed to do, we would always need to do is choose which initiatives were important enough to deserve national attention? Because there's there could be 20 or 25 of them. Um, and you know, you would pick one, you know, whatever it was, there's always something that had national implications because the way it affected environmental policy or tax policy or you know, whatever. Um, and the second thing would be just to talk about this kind of um, style of government by initiative we have here, because it isn't true in most states. And it's very interesting. And I would often write about how it works and whether it was a good thing or not. And most people would have trouble understanding it because it is so alien. But um, I, as you know, it's very much part of an outgrowth of the progressive movement. And I, you know, I'm not sure how well it's worked or whether or not it's been it's sort of gotten out of control. But there was one year um, where I think there were like 30 different initiatives on the, was that like five years ago? And I wrote a story about like, you know, is this system out of control or out of hand and how it works? And is it really better to do this than to have the legislature do it? And I, I say that say, saying I can't imagine it ever changing, not in our lifetimes at least. One, one thing in terms of uh, uh, maybe a, a contrast between uh, what you find in California in terms of governance and uh, what you might find elsewhere. Uh, I mean, there's always uh, controversies swirling around the mayor of New York. But the mayor of New York has a lot more authority over things than the mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, yeah. The mayor of New York uh, has a school system. Mm -hmm. uh, the mayor of Los Angeles doesn't. The mayor of, of, of New York has a welfare system, but that's done by the county here. It's not really the city. So uh, how, do you, how do you explain this to, uh, to people? We have this sort of very diffused centers of authority. Here we have a school board, here we have a, a district that does something else, here we have a city and a county and so on. Uh, how, 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 how does a journalist uh, go about explaining that uh, to places where there's much more centralized authority? I mean, one thing is that we write about the mayor here less than we would. If, say if I was an LA Times reporter covering New York, I'd write about de Blasio a lot more than I wrote about Garcetti or Villagosa before him. Um, just for that reason, but I do write about them. And when I do, um, I'll talk about the constraints on their leadership here and how different it is. I always use New York as a comparison than New York. And, um, you know, it puts them in a kind of difficult position because 
they are criticized by um, by residents who expect them to do more, and to some extent they can't do more. So I'll try to get that idea across. Um, even more confusing is the idea of LA City versus LA County versus you know whatever it is, 98 cities, and I mean that's even more confusing. So I generally try to deal with those issues when I'm writing about them by just writing around them rather than taking people down into the weeds and helping them understand it. But you know, early on, I you always want to be careful not to say LA City or LA County or the city or the county on second reference because you know it's an easy mistake for someone to make and I try to avoid making it. I'd like to turn, if we can now, to uh, some national issues. And we had already touched on the, uh, the uh, Biden uh, administration as far as connections with uh, California. Uh, people took uh, a lot of interest in the sort of 100-day evaluation. So I'll start with that. Uh, what would you say about his uh, uh, sort of 100 now plus days in office? Um, you know, I. I, I So backing up a little bit, I always thought that he was the best candidate the Democrats had to beat Trump. And I would find myself in a lot of arguments with people about that, but I always thought that he's exactly what the party needed to beat Trump, um, for all the reasons that I think it became clear. I was not so sure he would be a particularly activist president. And part of that was because of his age. Part of that was this sort of weird, I guess, prejudice I had that Vice president, former vice presidents don't do that much. That's not sure that's national, but that was what I was thinking. And I have been blown away by how aggressive he has been in his first, by this point, four months, five months. Just, I never expected it. I never expected him to try to do so many things and so big. Um, um, I think that history will show that he has been very effective on COVID. And, you know, we could certainly say that Trump deserves some credit for Operation Warp Speed. But you know, I, I don't think you can make a strong argument that Trump would have done as good a job running the government, getting the shots out as Biden has. And I think that one of the reasons we're in a much better place now than we were 100 days ago is because of that. Um, I think that he is very crafty in the way he's been working with Congress so far. So I think he talks about uh, bipartisanship. And I believe, having known him, you know, covered him over the years, that he believes that in his heart. But I also just think that he is in there with an agenda and he's not gonna get uh, distracted and he's gonna get his stuff through. And I think that he has made a decision um, and we'll see now on the infrastructure thing that he's got a year or two to get as much stuff through as he can. And then if the Democrats lose control of the House or the House and the Senate in two years, well, they're not going to be able to undo what he does. And the soonest that be able to happen would be 2025, right? If you get a Democratic, excuse me, a Republican president and a Republican Congress. So it makes a lot of sense in a uh, pragmatic sort of way, maybe in a brutal pragmatic sort of way to try to get as much done um, as you can now. And I think that's what's happening. And I, what I don't know is whether the sort of talks that we're seeing now on infrastructure are basically going through the motions, whether he thinks the Republicans are serious, whether he's serious. But I think that if they're not, he's gonna go the reconciliation route and get as much through with it as he can, uh, Manchin um, um, allowing. So the bottom line is he's been a much more active, a much more energetic. I don't wanna use the word visionary because I don't wanna make a value judgment on what he's doing, but he's got a very clear agenda of what he's trying to get done. and. I don't think anyone expected this on, in either party. And I mean, his presidency could end right now. And I think you look back at this and say, that was a hell of a first 100 days. The, um, one of the things that uh, has sort of marked that uh, period in terms of his agenda, um, possibly with the exception of the climate change issue is that uh, it's it's primarily domestic focused that is uh, getting the, the vaccine vaccination out getting the economy going yep. uh, doing all those sorts of things uh, and yet um, when you're president all kinds of other things happen and now he's got a a Middle East uh, crisis rolling uh, and uh, to some extent uh, uh, he's got a border situation 
uh, that uh, that uh, is kind of a, a sort of a, a steady uh, problem that, that doesn't go away. Um, so uh, sort of events begin to intervene uh, over time. Uh, so how is he going to balance this? He's, I mean, you can't just say, well, I'm going to, you know, forget about the Middle East and forget about this because uh, other people are not going to let you forget it. You know, I, one thing that struck me what made him such a surprisingly good candidate during the presidential race is he, he doesn't get distracted by stuff. And most presidents sort of get distracted. Oh, you know, it's like, oh my God, there's lines at the gas stations, right? Or I'm not sure if I've seen this. I don't want you to misunderstand. Oh, there's violence in, in uh, Israel. And he is just very focused on what he wants to get done. And, and you're, I think you're right to include climate on that list, by the way. So it's COVID, economy, climate. And that's just all he's doing. And he'll get distracted to some extent, but he's not going to lose his sight on that. And we can argue about whether that's a good thing or not. But I think if that's all he's doing for the first six months and he's making major advances in that, that's what matters to him. You know, we'll see how the Israeli thing um, evolves and whether there is more that the U.S. can or should do. I, I don't know right now. Um, but I think as far as he's concerned, he's going to want to just, you know, not focus on that and focus on the things that he believes he was brought into office to do. Slight exception, you can't ignore the gas stuff. That stuff can destroy a presidency, right? I mean, you know, you're too young, both Jimmy Carter and gas lines, right? So um, he's got to deal with that. And I think he is dealing with that. It looks like that's beginning to go away. But everything else, I think that every morning he wakes up and thinks, COVID, economy, COVID, economy. And it'll take a lot to pull him away from that kind of stuff. Washington, in general, people in my business are all about like, Here's a new rabbit. Here's a new thing to pay attention to. And he's been very good at not being distracted by this stuff. I don't think you can do that for four years, but you can certainly do that for the first six months and maybe for the first year. And I think, by the way, that is partly a function of his age and maturity. He's been around long enough to know what's important and what's not. He's been around long enough to sort of keep focused on stuff. And that's what he did in the campaign. That's what he's done during the opening months of the Biden presidency. Okay, well, um, we're getting close to the, the end of the hour. Uh, Aisha, are you on the line? I'm here. Uh, have we been getting questions? We have a few questions in the chat. Um, okay. One, Let me, one, do, you, do you want to read a few of them? I think sure. it's probably easier for you to do it than for me yeah. to do it. So I've also allowed everyone to unmute yourself. So feel free if you have a question to kind of either raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, so if the New York Times has a cultural correspondent, would that be in all the different cities and all the major bureaus in New York? Is there a different kind of emphasis depending on what city they're in? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to report that LA is, <laughs> is really the only city outside of New York where there's a cultural correspondent. If I'm wrong, send me an email, but I, I don't think there is one. Obviously there's an extensive cultural operation in New York and there are national cultural reporters that go out of, around the country and do things. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's significant that the newspaper thought enough about culture in California, and Southern California in particular, that they have created this job. They think it's important to the country. They think it's important to California. There's not a cultural re reporter in Chicago or Miami or Boston or Atlanta or um, Denver or any of the other places where we have bureaus, Houston. So it's very, it's singular to California. Any other questions? Um, please feel free to raise your hand. Let's see. Everyone's so shy today. I think Norma might have a question. No, okay, I see you trying to unmute. Um, okay, um, let's see, any other? Topics you want to talk about, Michael Heapy, to like wrap this up, or do you want to pivot to another? Um, Diane has a question. Hang on, Diane. Oh, two more questions now. Okay, Diane, you want to go ahead and do yours first, and then we'll do the one in the chat. I'm wondering about people like Maggie Haberman, whose bylines were on the front page every day, virtually. Now that her beat, I guess is the right term. Has has relocated. 
What is her life like these days? Um, it, Maggie is somebody who went like from, just never stopped. She was always on her phone. She was always tweeting. She was always breaking stories. She is a work of nature. I mean, she just is like <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, there's no other way to put it. So I think that in this kind of post-Trump era, assuming where we think we're in a post-Trump era, um, she's not quite as intense all the time. She's also writing a book about Trump, so she's pretty busy. But if you take a look at the paper, she's still breaking stories left and right. She's, she lives in New York. She works out of New York. Uh, but she's focusing on Trump more than Biden. She is a tremendous reporter. So I think whenever they need any kind of major reporting done on anything, <clears throat> excuse me, any domestic politics thing, they're going to turn to her. But her life is not as intense as it has been for the past four years. Not, not at least in, in the New York Times life. Obviously, the book life is more uh, is is taking a lot of time out, out of her life. But but she is. I don't know if you ever met her or seen her. She's really remarkable. Hmm. Another question is about Mayor Garcetti. Where do you think he'll be going? India, possibly. Hmm. Um, yeah, it sounds like that's a real serious thing. Um, um, I haven't talked to him about it, but I would bet that's something that sort of interests him. And he, you know, might feel that it's time to do something different. <clears throat> I saw the LA Times editorial page or an editorial urging him to stick around and finish the job. I mean, I don't know whether he will or should finish that. It might be time for some new leadership here. Um, th there had been some talk about him going into the White House, but for a variety of reasons, I think that never worked out. And then the ambassadorship might make more sense for him. To me, he wants to move to India. So besides your coverage of the Obama's election, is there another single event that you would cite as having a great significance in your career? I, uh, I love covering, this is for USA Today, the Bill Clinton election in 1992. Um, it was kind of early enough that there wasn't quite as much media covering it. So you really felt you were really had an inside spot on history. Clinton, I mean, I realize he's, he's probably going through a little bit of a difficult revisionist period now, but he was a hell of a candidate and he was really fascinating to cover. And I, I just love doing that. I covered Hillary Clinton when she ran for Senate in New York in 2000. That, that race was less interesting than you think it would be, um, partly because her strategy was just to sort of keep her head down. So there wasn't that much to write about. So, but, so in answer to your question, I would say, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but the two kind of cool stories I ever covered was Clinton in 92 and then um, Obama in 2008. I also covered um, Mario Cuomo, not Andrew Cuomo, Mario Cuomo when I was just a kid coming out of college uh, when he ran for governor of New York. And he was also a really great figure uh, to cover. He was a really, really good candidate. He's not like a son at all. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, um, I'll give it another minute or two if anyone has any final questions. Steve, do you want to say anything? Or, there, sorry, go ahead, Michael. The, there is a question from the Roberta in the chat, and she asks if there's any thoughts about uh, our Los Angeles Times, given its fairly new local leadership. I think it's, she suggests it's coming back. What's your opinion, Mr. Nagorny? Um, when I first came, so I followed the LA Times for years and always thought it was a terrific paper. And when I first came here in 2010, 10, mm -hmm. you would not believe, or actually you probably would believe, how many people would complain to me about how horrible the LA Times was. And I would say, yeah, the LA Times has declined, but most national newspapers have declined for all the reasons that I think we know about or can talk about. But it's still one of the best newspapers in the country. And I, I still feel that way. And Again, it's not what it was in the 90s, I guess, but few papers are. And um, it does, you know, I think it's done a very good job of covering homelessness. It, it just covers various things very well. It has flaws, definitely no question about it, but I think it's still a pretty good paper to a very good paper. It has a new editor now, <clears throat> excuse me, as you probably have seen. His name is Kevin Merida. Um, I weirdly, coincidentally, traveled with Kevin when we covered the Dukakis campaign in 1988. And I was working for USA Today, I think, Daily News. Uh, and he was working for the Dallas Morning News. 
And I've always had a lot of respect for him. So hopefully he'll take a good newspaper and make it great because LA needs an even better newspaper than what it has. Um, and it has a lot of big questions coming out. I mean, I think it needs a lot to do a lot of work in terms of digital, um, digital sort of development. I don't think it's quite where it should be. We have another two more questions in the chat. Um, if LA needs new leadership, who do you have in mind? Um, I think I would leave that question aside, <laughs> um, just being prudent. But I think that, you know, I, I, I'm not an advocate of term limits, but it is always good to get new people in there. And I, um, it feels like garcetti has been there for a while. And I think it's probably a good idea to get a new mayor with the caveat of what you guys raised before, which is that like mayor's not the most powerful job in the world. As, okay, as a cultural reporter covering Los Angeles, do you have a fix on coming public health requirements for small museums or other small government cultural sites that will imp impact those institutions? Um, this person works at, at a, as a docent in the Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollywood House, which is now a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So volunteers are wondering when we can reopen and what's safety for everyone as a small museum. Um. First of all, I would recommend it, that once it is open, that you would go see the house because it's pretty cool. Um, but listen, this is an obvious problem. I mean, you know, I was at the Hollywood Bowl is opening now, and I was there last night for a <clears throat> preview. <clears throat> excuse me, and they were like, "That's a huge space," and there were only four hundred people there. There's going to be four thousand people there. You can sort of do that and distance people. People can be seven feet, six feet apart. That's harder to do, you know, in in you know an architecture tour or a small gallery, and that's one, or a small theater, or a dance hall, and that's one, of the, that's one of the challenges people are facing. What I think you're gonna see is, will they begin requiring people who wanna to come to this show proof of vaccination? Because with proof of vaccination, at least in theory, again, looking at what CDC said today, it should be safe to have it crowded with people. But, you know, that's obviously a radioactive issue, and I don't know if they're gonna be able to do it. But you know, I certainly hope that in the months ahead, if not sooner, that as the restrictions come down, as the infection rate comes down, as the hospitalization rate comes down, obviously as the death rate comes down, they're going to be more comfortable in lessening these restrictions and allowing institutions like this to reopen. I mean, one of the really cool things in LA is how many tiny theaters there are, which, you know, right now. I wouldn't go to them, but I think that would be good. Hopefully that'll be good to change again in the coming months as more and more people are inoculated and uh, uh, infection rate goes down. But that's a great question. Uh, I think that's the last one in the chat. Okay, well, if, we're, um, if we've run out of questions, Adam, I wanna thank you very much for spending the uh, hour plus with us uh, and we look for those of us who have subscriptions to the New York Times. <laughs> we <all> do. <laughs> uh, uh, we uh, look forward to reading your commentary on the cultural scene here in the, uh, here on the West Coast. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for terrific questions, and you guys were great. Thank you. You have a nice day. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And then we have more events coming up later this month. Uh, another trip to Northern Italy with our Art Muse LA folk. Um, we have William Kinderman next month talking about Beethoven and politics. So stand by for that. And Big Score, um, a preview tour of the Motion Picture Academy Museum. So look forward to those uh, on the website. And we thank you so much, Mr. Nagorni and Dan. Appreciate all your time. Everybody be cool and stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.